I want to honor everyone's time and, and get started here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Brad Ray. I'm an associate professor at Wayne State University in the School of Social Work, and I'm also the director of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice. We're excited to have you on this webinar today to discuss pretrial risk assessment research in Indiana. Uh, myself and Dr. Eric Grauman have been involved in this project uh, since 2015 when we first met with the Indiana Office of Court Services about it. Um, at the time when we first were discussing this, we were very interested in the implementation of the IRAS PAT, a risk assessment tool. And we were interested in how different counties might implement this tool differently in their process um, and how it might have an impact on the overall pretrial population in the state. Uh, however, it quickly became apparent that in order to facilitate the implementation of this pretrial risk assessment tool, that we would have to conduct uh, local county validations of the instrument, something that had never been done before, to determine whether or not the IRAS PAT predicted pretrial misconduct as purported. Dr. Grom and I were fortunate enough to meet with Dr. Evan Lauder, uh, who at the time was an emerging national expert in the study of pretrial risk assessment. Dr. Lauder took on the task of developing procedures for uh, local validations of the tool, but also helped uh, take Indiana to the next level uh, on this area of research uh, with funding from the National Institute of Justice to assess the impact of pretrial risk assessment uh, on decisions and outcomes. She'll be discussing those findings later in the hour, uh, but I'd like to uh, first give an overview of the agenda for today. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. We're going to be starting um, with um, Judge Mark Spitzer, who's going to be telling us um, a little bit about the history of pretrial reform in Indiana, which has really sparked all of the research that we'll be talking about here today. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Stephanie Ruggles from Hamilton County and Troy Hatfield from Monroe County, local community partners who have been absolutely critical in completing this research and having it be as rigorous as it has been. And they're going to be discussing how they've incorporated the IRS PAT into their local systems. Uh, after that, we'll get an update on the status of our local validation efforts from Spencer Lawson. Uh, Spencer is a doctoral student at Michigan State University who's been working with us on this project since he was at IEPY. After that, Dr. Lauder and Carmen Diaz will present the results from the NIH, NIJ study on the accuracy and fairness of pretrial release decisions in Indiana and then turn it over to Dr. Eric Grauman, who will conclude with some reflections on how research like this can be accomplished in future directions for pretrial research. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, today, my role will be moderating the event. Uh, as you might have already noticed, uh, you, your audio and video are disabled for this function, for this event. Uh, we just wanna make sure that it's as seamless as possible. So the only way that participants can interact is through the Q&A uh, uh, function, the, question and answer chat function. We highly encourage folks to ask questions throughout the event. Uh, we'll be reading them and trying to moderate them uh, for the Q&A portion. But those questions that we're not able to get to will compile into a document that we'll send out to attendees from today. Please do keep in mind that if you put questions in the Q&A box, they will be um, visible to all attendees. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker of the day, Judge Mark Spitzer. All right, thank you, and uh, greetings from sunny Grant County, Indiana, um, and appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. I'm, my task is going to be um, to kind of go over where we've been um, in this project of pretrial re reform, um, and then obviously the rest of the panel will be talking a little bit about where we are going. Um, and where we have been starts with Indiana's Constitution. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, Indiana's Constitution, um, there are two provisions of Indiana's Constitution that are significant for our purposes here today. First of all, Article 1, Section 16, um, and you'll notice that that says that excessive bail shall not be required. And then Article 1, Section 17 says that offenses other than murder or treason shall be bailable by sufficient sureties. So what that tells us is that our Constitution says, first of all, um, and this is an obvious point, bail is permitted. And then uh, secondly, bail, um, if uh, set, may not be excessive. Now, our Supreme Court has interpreted um, Article 1, Section 17's provisions to say that bail higher than an amount reasonably calculated uh, 
um, to assure the accused, accused presence would be excessive. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So if we look at the history of implementation of those constitutional um, provisions, um, it's generally been a charge-based bail type of cash-based bail system. Um, and so um, historically, um, we've had charge-based bond schedules in Indiana. And what I mean by that is that typically counties will set um, a bail or bond schedule based upon a charge or level um, or class of the felony. Um, then uh, when individuals are arrested, they can be released if they're able to meet the cash or surety requirements uh, of the court approved bond schedule. Um, what that also means is, if the, is that if the individuals are unable to meet those requirements, then they are, not, they are going to be held in custody until they're taken before the court for an initial hearing. Um, and um, so what that means is that, that, that um, depending on what county you're arrested in, um, that may determine whether or not you could uh, obtain pretrial release based upon a, a certain uh, a, a amount. Um, uh, all else equal. So um, one of the things that we found in Indiana is that people were often held um, on, uh, in jail on relatively low bail amounts. And typically you didn't have an examination of that ability to pay um, uh, until you got to a subsequent hearing um, that was requested by your attorney once you were appointed an attorney or you had retained an attorney. This led to individuals um, being uh, detained in jail for a significant period of time um, because they were unable to post fairly um, small uh, bonds. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So pretrial reform um, was a recognition that this was um, a, a, an inequitable system and that there, there needed to be a change to the system. And so, um, pretrial reform really has three goals. Um, what we call them as the three M's. Um, maximizing the release of, of pretrial defendants. Um, and there we're recognizing the presumption of innocence and the fact that, um, excuse me, the fact that um, uh, if you detain people pretrial, then um, that can in, result in certain harmful effects to um, those individuals. Perhaps they lose their job, um, perhaps um, they don't have anybody to care for their children, um, and so all sorts of, um, a, 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 of bad things will have a tendency um, to happen if people are, are held in jail for a significant period of time. So that's the first M, is maximizing release. Um, maximizing public safety as well. Um, we certainly um, want to maintain public safety in pretrial reform. And then the third M is maximizing court appearance. The expectation is that when individuals are released on pretrial, that they will um, return um, to a subsequent hearing. Uh, next slide, please. So this, is a, uh, this slide sort of depicts the history of pretrial reform in Indiana, and it starts um, really with uh, the adoption of the Indiana Risk Assessment System. Um, and in, in 2010, that included the IRAS PAT um, uh, pretrial assessment tool. PAT stands for pretrial assessment tool. Um, now the IRAS is a system of um, assessment tools, including um, uh, uh, assessments for uh, juveniles, assessments for individuals who are on um, supervision, um, and assessments for individuals who are at uh, in, in incarceration as well at DOC. Um, IRAS PAT is one of those tools. The IRAS PAT was not used um, very often until about 2016 um, in the, the um, pretrial uh, pilot program. In between then, a couple of things happened that were, were um, significant. In 2010, our county, Grant County, was selected by National Institute of Corrections as one of seven jurisdictions in the United States to participate in the evidence-based decision-making initiative. Um, in 2013, um, the Supreme Court formed a committee to study evidence-based pretrial reform. Um, and then in 2014, Indiana as a state joined that EBDM initiative as one of three state level um, participants. 
um, a committee was formed and then the, the original committee studying pretrial was merged with the EVDM committee um, and a pretrial um, project was initiated. Um, and a criminal rule 26 was adopted in 2017. That, that criminal rule speaks to um, pretrial in Indiana as well and um, requires the use of um, an assessment uh, tool. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our pilot program. Um, in, in Indiana, there were um, 11 pilots um, that, um, uh, uh, pilot uh, uh, jurisdictions um, that participated in the program. And you have the counties there uh, uh, at the top. Uh, Grant County um, was, was one of those counties. Each of those would administer the IRAS PAT um, assessment tool um, and um, would use release and supervision matrices and would also collect data on um, the work that they did. Um, then there were specific um, practices um, that were, were adopted by the local policy teams. And these are different, as if you're familiar with these counties, they're different size jurisdictions. And so the operations um, did um, vary a bit from county to county. And then we collected data uh, to kind of see how things went and shared that data. Um, we also got um, funding from Department of Corrections and the Supreme Court uh, to implement the projects. Uh, next slide, please. So um, what we sought to do in the EBDM project was to use uh, evidence-based practices. Um, and evidence-based based practices are the objective, balanced, and responsible use of current research and data to inform and guide criminal justice decisions so that public safety outcomes for our communities are improved. Um, next slide, please. While we're talking about pretrial today, um, the EBDM process looked at um, a variety of justice system decision points and sought to implement evidence-based practices at each of those um, decision points. And this slide just has, um, it kind of sets out what the, the justice system decision points are. You'll notice that pretrial comes early on in the process. You'll, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Next slide, please. So EBDM had really four key principles um, related to it. Um, the first one is that the professional judgment of criminal justice system decision makers is enhanced when informed by evidence-based knowledge. In other words, uh, research can help us make better judgments. Number two is that every interaction within the criminal justice system op offers an opportunity to contribute to harm reduction. When we interact with um, individuals in the justice system, every interaction we have can help um, promote behavior change. Number three is that systems achieve better outcomes when they operate collaboratively at the individual agency and system levels. This means we get out of our silos um, and um, we, we share information and we share uh, decision making as well. And then number four, and this is what we're talking about here today, is that the criminal justice system will continually learn and improve when professionals make decisions based on the collection, analysis, and use of data and information. So this is an important takeaway from this process is that EBDM is a method of collaborative decision making and that as part of this method there's a built-in component that says you sh we should collect data, we should analyze that data, and we should respond to that data. And so that's what we're um, discussing today. And so part of um, this process is an expectation that we will make adjustments um, to what we do based upon um, if the data reveals desirable or undesirable outcomes. Um, one of the things obviously we're gonna be talking about today and it's timely um, is race and demographics. Um, and um, I say it's timely um, because uh, we know what the conversation that we're having um, about the justice system in our country. But I would point out the fact that this was built in or baked into the cake back in 2010 when this process um, is started. Um, and uh, so this is a process that we can use um, really um, in, uh, will address some of the concerns that we're talking about um, now as a nation with regards to our system. Um, I will hand over now um, the conversation to Stephanie and Troy and talk about their implementation. Thanks, Judge Spitzer. Stephanie and Troy, you can feel free to take it away. 
Hi, my name is Stephanie Ruggles, and I'm the Director of Pretrial Services for Hamilton County, Indiana. I'd um, like to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Um, next slide. I'd like to start off with just talking a little bit about um, Hamilton County, our, our makeup. Um, we have about three, uh, 340,000 individuals um, that live in our county. We're the fourth largest county in the state of Indiana, and we're also the fastest growing. Um, we're looking probably to be the third largest uh, by the end of this year. Some of the um, criminal case filings um, numbers, about a little over 6,700 in 2018 is what we were looking at. Our judiciary is made up of seven judicial officers that hear criminal cases. We do have a few um, city and town courts, but they do not um, deal with any criminal court cases. Under our judiciary, we have a adult and juvenile probation department, 47 adult probation officers and 15 juvenile probation officers. We also have two problem solving courts in our county, a veterans court and a drug court. Also part of our um, probation department is a court alcohol and drug program. And then most recently, um, pretrial services was added as an arm of our judiciary. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about our initial implementation um, with pretrial practices. Um, it was late 2014, early 2015 when Indiana was selected, as Judge Spitzer said, as an evidence-based decision-making planning site. We were one of six counties as well selected um, in Indiana to look at pretrial reform, bail reform. In 2016, we sent a representative from our county to the National Institute of Corrections orientation for pretrial executives training in Colorado. And part of being a pilot county, um, we did receive technical assistance from the National Institute of Corrections. So one of the first things that we did um, with that assistance was to map out our entire um, local criminal justice system from the decision points of arrest all the way to discharge um, and looking at all of those key decision points in between. Um, one of the first things we did after the mapping exercise is we established a local stakeholder group. Um, the, this group consisted of members from the judiciary, the prosecuting attorney's office, defense bar, law enforcement, probation, community corrections, mental health, victims assistance programs and our jail. And we initially met once a week. Um, this group met to look at developing our policies, our procedures. Uh, we developed a local matrix, which incorporates not only the level of the alleged criminal offense, but also then the IRS PAT score. Um, part this group also established a target population, which is the same um, today, which is all new criminal arrests um, in our county. The matrix, um, the way we developed it was to give us a delegated release authority. So if an individual is found to be appropriate for release, um, they can be released without having to see a judicial officer or having to pay a um, monetary amount to be released. Initially, we started um, our pilot program um, as a partnership with both our probation and community corrections agencies, utilizing resources and namely staff from both of these departments to complete the assessments at our jail and then provide the ongoing monitoring and supervision of the pretrial defendants. Another thing we did initially was to conduct some education to our local criminal justice stakeholders. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to explain uh, what we were wanting to do with uh, bail reform. We did that with our local defense bar, our prosecuting attorney's office, um, jail personnel, um, county council members, and county commissioners. Next slide. Um, some, since our initial implementation, uh, we've gone through many changes and a lot of growth. Um, the, probably the biggest was um, we quickly realized that using um, staff from both probation and community corrections uh, was not working for us. They were experiencing a hard time um, coming from a post-conviction type of supervision to do uh, that type of supervision and pretrial in the same day. 
So early in 2017, we established a standalone pretrial agency, which is under the authority of the court. Um, we also looked at revising our local matrix. Um, in the beginning, it was a little, what I like to call chunky. So we kind of slimmed it down a little bit, made it easier for us to understand and for our stakeholders to understand as well. Uh, we continue to this day to hold stakeholder meetings. However, we went from meeting once a week, and we did that for almost two years, um, meeting once a week, going over um, anything that was happening in, in our county and other counties um, to talk about. We're now down to meeting once a month, um, but we still have those um, individuals at the table. We also looked at changing um, our procedures and our forms over time. Um, looking at what was working and what wasn't working. Um, another big change that we had was our state started and created a text court reminder system that we can utilize. Um, so our the defendants under pretrial supervision uh, receive text messages five days and one day prior to their court hearings. Next slide. Some of um, the facilitators to our implementation, um, one of the big ones was our, um, the state of Indiana created a case management system that can be um, utilized by both pretrial service agencies, probation departments, and community corrections agencies. And um, this has been um, very beneficial to us. It allows us the ability to collect the necessary data um, specifically what um, is listed in the Measuring What Matters publication by NIC. So we can track all those data points within this case management system for pretrial. I think one of the best things we did was to have a team approach and making sure that we had all the right people um, at the table to make decisions. Um, it may sound daunting to have weekly meetings, but it really gave us the opportunity to address any concerns quickly. Um, to adapt and to move forward with making any changes that we needed to do. Um, separate but collaborative agencies, um, we have been very fortunate in our county to have had a long-standing tradition of collaboration between our different stakeholders um, within the county and that really helped us in formulating this pre standalone pretrial services agency of having support from our sheriff's department, um, whether it was them giving us office space in the jail to conduct pretrial assessments, um, the probation department giving us office space in their buildings to hold our supervision meetings, um, both agencies and community corrections um, helping us with office supplies and training and equipment. Um, so that really um, was beneficial to us to have that collaborative agreement with them. Next slide. Some of the um, barriers to implementation that we had, if I had to do it all over again, um, I definitely would have uh, spent some more time with the actual road officers from law enforcement, explaining what pretrial services um, is about and what we were trying and what we're accomplishing here in this county. Staffing and funding were definitely um, somewhat of a, a barrier or roadblock in the very beginning. Once we transitioned to a standalone agency, then um, ramping up and hiring individuals um, to be able to staff what we now have is a 24 seven operation. Um, and with that comes funding. We receive funding from several different funding sources, both at the county level and at the state level. And I would say another um, barrier that we had was data. Um, in our county, we did not um, have a good baseline data for, um, for example, for fair to appears. Um, our judges would tell you that it was a problem, um, but we had no data to really quantify it. So um, that was um, a barrier that we had. And then, and then training is kind of an ongoing barrier that we have here in the pretrial world. Um, the pretrial initiative is new to Indiana and in many other states around the United States. Um, finding affordable training um, is problematic. Um, fortunately, leaders in our state have started to open up their training from individual um, associations to the pretrial staff and agencies, so we're hoping um, that there's more opportunity for that.
Next slide. Some of our future initiatives, um, we just recently, um, just in the last couple of weeks, received certification from the Indiana Office of Court Services um, indicating that we are using and practicing best practices in um, the pretrial um, services world. Um, so we will look to continue that certification. Um, right now it is um, until the first of the year and then we will look at obtaining that for a three-year uh, period. And then some of, another future initiative we have is to look at our violation response um, and really to discuss what is our tolerance um, in regards to technical violations um, and making sure that we are not hindering these individuals um, during the pretrial stage. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Troy Hatfield and um, I'm with Monroe County Probation, the Deputy Chief Probation Officer here. And if we can go ahead and do the next slide, I'll try to be brief, uh, not repeat some of the things that Stephanie had said. Um, but if uh, you'll look, you'll see a little bit of our profile uh, in terms of our population about how many criminal case filings that we have. One difference that we um, are that sets us apart from Hamilton County is that we're a unified department for community supervision. So we have got about 80 employees and we have adult probation, juvenile, community corrections, uh, court alcohol and drug program, problem solving courts, and then now pretrial services all under one umbrella um, with our department. So they're all separate divisions. So you go to the next slide. As far as our implementation, we are also a pilot site that received some technical assistance from the National Institute of Corrections, which was invaluable in my opinion. Um, as well as we were able to send some staff to that training. But one of the things after we uh, got back from training that we did is we established a team of local stakeholders. Um, uh, and it was really important to have all of these players at the table to help us with decision making and discussions on philosophy uh, of different things and how we wanted to operate this program. Um, and I will say that having uh, the strong leadership from our judges um, to move this project forward uh, was essential. Um, and it continues today with our presiding judge, Marianne Beekhoff, uh, kind of leading the way of the pretrial efforts. And the other, I think, important piece with our stakeholders um, that it's important to involve in uh, with in this process is your county commissioners and your county council. Um, and not necessarily, uh, you know, educating them on things later, but involving them in some of those discussions and informing the process as you go um, so that you can garner that support um, throughout uh, the project. Um, you know, when we started our local stakeholder teams, we had a lot of discussions. And one of the things, to give you an example, is that target population, trying to narrow that down. Um, uh, that technical assistance was extremely helpful in facilitating those conversations, but it was helpful to have all of those disciplines at the table. But we also looked at and, and focused a lot on our data and what we were able to collect at that time to kind of figure out how we were going to set up our program. Um, next slide, please. Some of the changes that we had over time was really involved a lot of that data in informing our practices. Um, when Stephanie said that her uh, their recommendation matrix was a little chunky, um, I would say ours was morbidly obese when we first started. It was uh, enormous, um, the different kind of levels we had and the different options um, that we had available. And as we collected data over time, we found that we did not need um, all of those different options and, and levels. And then we, we collapsed those choices down um, to reduce it uh, to just a very a narrow set of monitoring levels uh, that we have. We also uh, removed um, a lot of the uh, kind of recommendations of electronic monitoring, drug testing, and those things as options uh, because we just didn't find that they were any more effective than pretrial monitoring or case management um, uh, in terms of the public safety issue. Um, you know, the other changes that we made is, is uh, uh, we had a very frank discussion on, on violation response and how we handle responses uh, uh, to try to handle those things, whether those be administratively um, or through going back through court intervention. Uh, our, our local team still meets uh, quarterly to review data, um, to, learn, to learn about our program and how successful we're being in certain areas. Uh, and whether that is to track new data elements, I mean, we can do those things and talk about them. And it's, it's very important to have that local team involved in that process. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is that uh, the changes over time, um, it wasn't just our local data that helped. Our partnerships with these research projects um, have been tremendously uh, 
um, uh, it, it, it created a, a huge advantage for us in terms of being able to uh, learn about what's effective and learn about what we're doing um, in, in uh, these pretrial programs. And not only uh, are we learning, but um, our, our partnerships with these researchers have created some really positive, long-lasting relationships um, that have uh, moved us on into some other projects in other areas as well. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, some of the facilitators, uh, we have a case management system that we can track any of our data points, um, anything that we need, and we can add data points without uh, having big uh, changes or developer changes to them. Um, and uh, some of the other advantages is of, uh, like uh, Stephanie had said, is there's advantages of working within or in cooperation with existing departments, whether that's infrastructure, staff resources, and that. Go to the next slide, please. Some of the barriers that we experience is um, our pretrial staff, our probation officers, they came from that post-sentence world, and we really have to keep and be mindful of uh, the differences of the post-sentence world versus pretrial. Um, we also had a few, uh, you know, barriers in terms of funding and staff resources. Uh, the volume and pace is much different in a pretrial setting. Um, and initial training opportunities, like uh, Stephanie said, are for pretty scarce for all of our different disciplines. Next slide, please. And then some of the future initiatives that we're going to explore further is um, looking at that delegated release authority for pretrial staff. But we also want to do a, 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 an analysis on the collection and use of pretrial fees. Um, for some of those initiatives um, that we want to move forward with in the future. Next slide. And I think the next presenter um, is Spencer. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Lawson, third year doctoral student uh, in the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University. So as the previous uh, speakers kind of have alluded to indicated, Indiana's pretrial initiative is part of a national movement for pretrial and bail reform efforts. Uh, next slide. So as Judge Spitzer mentioned, uh, we had 11 pilot counties take part uh, in this initiative. Uh, but the outstanding question that was asked was, does the IRSPAT predict pretrial misconduct? Does it do its job? Uh, there are a few local validations within the broader pretrial scholarship on predictive accuracy of pretrial risk assessments. And there has been no formal validation of uh, the IRSPAT. So the research team involved in this initiative aimed to answer this question and to address the gap by providing county level validation uh, of the IRSPAT assessment in these 11 counties. Uh, so this portion of the webinar is really going to focus on those county level validations. Uh, so far, we've completed five validations, and we're currently working on another one right now. Uh, next slide. So one of the lessons we learned as researchers was the complex reality of how pretrial risk assessment tools are integrated into local practice. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to adopting and implementing a pretrial risk assessment tool in the local practice. So was, as was in the case, uh, as was in the case in our work with Indiana's pilot, the 11 jurisdictions were granted flexibility to tailor the program implementation and pretrial service operations of their pilots based off the needs of their community. Uh, the jurisdictions implemented their own independent pretrial pilots using individualized approaches. So what that means is it could be differences in tool purpose or pretrial populations could vary. The data systems used uh, could be different. Um, so based on that, we had to adopt a local validation strategy to, to really examine the predictive accuracy of the IRSPAT assessments. So the research team developed protocols that balance these county level practices with strict inclusion criteria to really model prototypical case processing. So in other words, we needed to develop a process that allowed for temporal congruence during this pretrial period so that means a jail booking uh, to be accurately matched with an appropriate IRSPAT assessment for a defendant, and that jail booking needed to be linked with a subsequent court case disposition. So the inclusion criteria we used uh, helped us link assessments as closely as possible to a jail booking and a new court case filing. Uh, next slide. So we've been talking a lot about the IRSP, IRSPAT but specifically, what is it? So uh, on this slide, this is the instrument that is being used to screen for pretrial release. 
Uh, it is a seven item tool that was developed to specifically assess risk of any arrest, any new arrest, and any FTA and pretrial defendants. So broadly speaking, it's going to tap into four criminogenic risk domains. So we had three items that looked at criminal history, one item with employment, one item that tapped into residential stability, and then we had two items on the IRSPT that looked at substance use. Uh, so as you can kind of see, the five item, there are five items that are scored on a zero to one rating scale with two items scored on a zero to two scale. And this will result in a total score ranging from zero to nine. And then you can break down the, that total score to create three risk levels. Uh, low, uh, which would range from zero to two, a moderate risk score would range from three to five, and a high risk score uh, a risk uh, classification would range from six to nine. Uh, next slide. So uh, here's a graph of total score distributions overall and by county. So for the pooled sample, and what I mean by that is we pool the data across all five counties. Uh, the IRS PAT total scores average 3.06, and that corresponds to a moderate risk level. Uh, next slide. So here's a graph of risk level distributions, once again, overall and by county. Uh, so that overall one was the one that's in a, a blue color, that first uh, column. And so for the pooled sample, uh, the majority of defendants were classified at uh, moderate risk level, followed by low and high risk levels. Um, next slide. So here's a table by county of area under the curve statistics for total scores. And for researchers that study risk assessments, AUCs are the gold standards. So an AUC value can range from 0.5 to 1, with 0.5 indicating predictive accuracy at chance levels. And if you have an AUC of 1, that would indicate perfect prediction of the intended outcome you're looking at. So as you can see across all outcomes for all counties, uh, the AUC estimates correspond to good to excellent levels of predictive accuracy. And as you can see on the right side of the screen, uh, AUC interpretation, so a fair interpretation would be 0.55 to 0.63, good 0.64 to 0.7, and then excellent would be 0.71 um, or above um, in terms of the AUC um, statistic. Uh, next slide. So here we have the pooled sample. Um, and these AUC estimates correspond to good levels of predictive accuracy for any new arrest and excellent levels for any FTA or any arrest. Uh, next slide. Um, so next we have proportion of defendants with misconduct at each, rest, um, at each risk level. Uh, and then when you break it down by risk level, we are seeing a similar incremental gain in proportion of misconduct as we move from low risk to high. So as expected, high risk participants experience higher rates of all outcomes relative to moderate and low risk participants. And this is what tells us that the instrument is producing similar levels of predictive accuracy. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at item level functioning of IRS PAT assessments in these local validations. And there were four items that uniquely contributed to the prediction of all three outcomes. So uh, three or more prior incarcerations, item three, uh, unemployment relative to full-time employment, which is item four, uh, item five, which uh, taps into residential stability, uh, and then item seven, which is a severe drug use problem. Uh, next slide. So despite the overwhelming evidence suggesting the need for local validations of pretrial risk assessment tools, jurisdictions continue to use these instruments without rigorous local validation. Uh, Indiana criminal justice practitioners and policymakers, however, recognize the importance of local validation and launched its pretrial initiative and partnered with researchers to validate the IRS P18 pilot counties. So kind of in summary, like what did we find? Well, overall, the IRS P18 assessments produced good to excellent levels of uh, predictive accuracy across pretrial misconduct outcomes. And then when we situate these findings in the broader literature, like a recent meta-analysis um, that came out of North Carolina State University on pretrial risk assessments, the IRS PAD predictive accuracy estimates mirrored or exceeded other pretrial risk assessment tools commonly used. 
So as a recap, IRS PAT AUC values range from 0.67 to 0.72. Um, but to compare these with some other values from other tools, uh, next slide. Uh, the meta-analysis found that the ORES PAT had an AUC value of 0.68. Uh, next slide. The public safety assessment had AUC values ranging from 0.64 to 0.66. Uh, next slide. The Virginia pretrial risk assessment instrument had values ranging from 0.64 to 0.69. Next slide. Uh, the federal pretrial risk assessment instrument ranged from 0.67 to 0.73. Uh, next slide. So regarding our next steps, uh, six pilot counties remain in the researchers in our workflow concerning local validation of the IRES uh, PAT. So thank you all for your time. Um, if you would like copies of completed county level reports, uh, please contact Dr. Lauder. Um, and with that, I yield my time to the next speaker. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Evan Lauder. I'm an assistant professor at George Mason University and I am delighted to uh, be presenting today with my co-presenter Carmen Diaz who is a uh, rising doctoral student at Indiana University. And today we're gonna be talking about our, um, some findings from an NIJ funded study on the use of pretrial risk assessments in practice. Okay, and I'm trying to, next slide please. Okay, and this is just a quick disclaimer. Uh, the study was funded by NIJ. Uh, so these findings, conclusions, recommendations are all ours and do not reflect uh, those of the Department of Justice. So I wanted to start out quickly by just talking about some of the rationale for this investigation. And it really um, originated from kind of examining the kind of scope of research on uh, pretrial risk assessments and finding that most of the research on pretrial risk assessments has really focused on examining um, the ability of these tools to predict, pre predict pretrial outcomes. Um, and uh, kind of along with this, there's been a much more limited body of research that has looked at the use of tools um, of these tools in practice. And that is um, particularly of importance because there is growing concern about the potential for racial bias and risk assessment. So as many of you know, the Pretrial Justice Institute earlier this year put out a statement basically saying that they were no longer supporting pretrial risk assessment tools um, because they um, you know, only serve to kind of exacerbate existing uh, disparities in pretrial release um, processing and decision making. Um, but to me, that raises kind of an interesting question about the distinction between um, what has been kind of described in the research literature as the difference between predictive bias and disparate impact. And much of the research to date has really focused on this issue of predictive bias, which refers to kind of the ability of, um, or, you know, evidence that the, these, these assessments are producing different, um, you know, levels of predictive accuracy between uh, different groups. So in this case, it's usually minorities and non-minorities versus this broader question of disparate impact, which really asks the question, okay, well, you know, regardless of whether we see pretrial or predictive bias in the tools um, themselves, when these tools are used in practice, do we see actual evidence that they are, um, you know, resulting in some sort of disparate impact, that they are affecting, um, you know, minorities, uh, you know, to a greater uh, degree and negatively, right, relative to non-minorities. Um, and so that was really the motivation for this study was to actually look at the use of these tools in practice. So our objectives um, overall was to, um, our overall objective was to compare risk assessment guided decisions to those decisions that were made without risk assessment information. And we had three um, kind of sub objectives. The first was to look at whether the use of risk assessments actually improved risk management decisions relative to practice as usual. So really focusing on those pretrial misconduct outcomes. Secondly, to see whether um, pretrial pre risk assessments improve the fairness of pretrial release decisions for racial minorities relative to practice as usual. And third, whether there was evidence of judge level variation in pretrial release decisions. So the findings we're gonna to present today are really gonna focus on those first two objectives. <laughs> 
So a quick overview of our methods. This was a retrospective quasi-experimental study, which means there's no random assignment um, of approximately 7,400 pretrial defendants. We really focused on kind of the first year that each of these four counties were implementing um, the IRAS PAT to inform uh, pretrial release decisions. And our main study condition was the pilot risk assessment condition. So we define this as individuals who were booked into jail during the one year pilot period and had a risk assessment administered within three days of booking, kind of keeping with kind of the timing for initial hearings. And that was around 2,600 uh, participants. And our second, um, and then we, we additionally had two comparison conditions. So um, the rationale for this is that we wanted to kind of increase the rigor of the study and um, increase our ability to make causal inferences about the uh, specific effect of risk assessments on um, various outcomes. So our first comparison group was um, what we call the pilot period comparison. And these were individuals who were booked into jail during the one year pilot period, but they didn't have a risk assessment administered within that three day uh, window. And that was around 1600 uh, individuals across the four counties. And then we also had a pre-pilot comparison condition. So these were individuals who were booked into jail in the year prior to the pilot period. Uh, and that was around 3200 individuals. And importantly, um, what you'll see when we present the results is that we actually present um, two graphs for each uh, outcome. And the reason why we do that is because we replicated all of our analyses two times for each comparison condition to kind of look at convergence of findings across these two comparisons in order to make conclusions about the effects of risk assessments. Um, some other kind of technical details, we did conduct matching so that, um, you know, the all the conditions were matched on a variety of, variety of different demographic and case characteristics. And we also conducted what we call kind of sensitivity analyses to see whether adherence to structured guidelines actually um, affected the impact of risk assessments on pretrial release and misconduct outcomes. And there were three counties of the four that we studied that actually had in developed and were using structured guidelines at the um, time of this study. And here's just a quick overview of the outcomes that we looked at in terms of pretrial release decisions and pretrial misconduct outcomes. I'm not going to talk about all of them uh, today, but I just wanted to give you kind of a flavor for uh, what we looked at. So first I want to talk about our um, findings with respect to pretrial release decisions. And really um, the overwhelming finding was that risk assessments were associated with higher rates of non-financial release, so release on own recognizance, and lower rates of bond set decisions. Uh, we also found pretty strong evidence that adherence to structured guidelines really amplified the effect of risk assessments on pretrial release outcomes. And I'll give you um, some examples of what this looked like. So here are kind of the rates of uh, that initial decision of release on own recognizance or non-financial release uh, for individuals in the study. So on the left, you can see the, uh, with respect to the pilot comparison and on the right, the pre-pilot comparison. And what you see is that the risk assessment, that pilot condition was associated with higher rates of um, you know, non-financial release at the initial um, pretrial release decision. But when we looked at um, kind of the role of adherence to structured guidelines, what we found is that, you know, there was still an increase in the likelihood of non-financial release of that initial decision for uh, pilot risk assessment participants that had non-adherent decisions to those structured guidelines. But those effects were much more amplified when decisions were adherent to um, what the, you know, matrix recommendation was. And we also uh, stratified our samples um, by the month that these individuals came into uh, the jail based on kind of the start of the pilot period. So we have three different lines representing the three different samples. And what you'll see is that for that blue, um, you know, pilot risk assessment line, what we see is at the start of the pilot, you know, during those first couple months, there was a dramatic increase in, you know, the likelihood of individuals receiving uh, non-financial release. Um, What's interesting, particularly because many studies have found that, um, you know, the, the impact of risk assessments on these kind of release decisions appears to be somewhat time limited, that, you know, these effects kind of dissipate over time. At least in kind of the one year period that we looked at, um, we weren't finding evidence that, you know, judges were kind of returning to practice as usual or that, you know, 
uh, rates of non-financial release were returning to baseline. In fact, we actually found um, a slight uh, linear trend overall. Here are the overall um, rates of uh, any pretrial release during the pilot period by um, uh, study, study condition. So what you'll see is that um, for pilot participants that had decisions that were non-adherent, they actually had um, lower rates of uh, any release relative to comparison conditions. And it wasn't until we looked at those pilot participants who had adherent decisions um, until we saw, you know, an increase in the likelihood of pretrial release. And that was around two to 4% um, on top of, you know, already pretty high rates of pretrial release in these four counties. And similar trends for days in pretrial detention. So as you can see, non-adherent participants, um, you know, much longer duration in pretrial detention. And it wasn't until we looked at those uh, individuals who had adherent decisions to uh, structured guidelines that we really saw that risk assessment condition was associated with a reduction in the number of days in pretrial detention. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand things off to uh, my co-presenter, Carmen Diaz, who's gonna talk about some of the findings by race. Hello, everyone. So as you might recall, one of our primary objectives was to investigate whether there was evidence of a disparate impact of pretrial risk assessments by race. What we found is that across all of the different outcomes we looked at, there was little evidence of disparate impact of risk assessments. Rather, the risk assessments were associated with similar changes in pretrial release outcomes for both black and white defendants. Broadly, when we excluded risk assessment and looked across all of our different outcomes looking for disparities, we only found three outcomes where there were differences for black and white defendants. The first was the likelihood of any pretrial release, the second was bond amount, and the third was the number of days spent in pretrial detention. Overall, we found that black defendants were less likely to receive any pretrial release had higher bond amounts and spent more days in pretrial detention. The following slides will review how the risk assessments impacted these trends. So for the any pretrial release outcome, you can see that there's a similar trend in the impact of the pilot risk assessment condition relative to the pilot comparison. There's a slight increase for both groups in the rates of pretrial release. With respect to the pre-pilot comparison group, there's a very small increase for white defendants and no change for black defendants in any pretrial release. Regardless of both of these trends, we found no evidence of a statistically significant interaction between race and the risk assessment condition for either of these two comparisons. This suggests that risk assessment was not differentially associated with changes in pretrial release for black and white defendants. So moving on to bond amount outcomes, in the left graph here, relative to the pilot comparison, we can see that the risk assessment is associated with a similar decrease in bond amount for both white and black defendants. With respect to the pre-pilot comparison condition, we can see that the direction of the trend is actually different. Relative to the pre-pilot comparison condition, the risk assessment is associated with an increase in bond amount for both black and white defendants. This should make sense because we found that risk assessments were associated with a reduction in financial release, so fewer individuals are likely receiving low cash bail amounts here. What's important though when we're considering the fairness of risk assessments is that the difference we see between the comparisons and the pilot risk assessment conditions is a similar if not identical trend for both groups, meaning that we're not seeing any evidence of a disparate impact. So for the number of days spent in pretrial detention across both comparisons, we saw a similar decrease for both black and white defendants. Um, as you can see, white defendants experienced around a six day decrease in pretrial detention in the pilot comparison, and then around three days in the pre-pilot com comparison. Uh, for our black defendants, we saw around a nine day decrease in the pilot comparison and a four day decrease in the pre-pilot comparison. Again, we saw no evidence of a disparate impact here, but rather similar reductions in the number of days in pretrial detention for both groups. So moving on in the next few slides, we're gonna take a look at pretrial misconduct outcomes. Broadly, we found that risk assessments were associated with a slightly greater rate of new nonviolent arrests, but no difference in FTAs. Overall, the arrest rate increased about 5% for pilot participants. So this next graph is an examination of the arrest rate by when each participant came into the study period. 
The dotted line here at the center represents the start of the pilot period, and then the rates are calculated by month for the defendants who were booked into the jail on an original offense in that month. So what we can see is that after our pilot start date here in the center, there's a jump in the proportion of individuals who were rearrested during the pilot period relative to both comparison groups. So despite the fact that we found a slightly higher rearrest rate, we actually found that there was a decrease in the overall arrest rate as time went on in those first 12 months of the pilot period. So looking at any new arrests specifically, although there's a difference between the pilot and comparison participants, the increase across both comparisons was fairly small. There's around a 3% increase in the any new arrest rate for both groups. However, um, we found no statistically significant difference in FTA outcomes across both comparisons, as you can see here. And now just to wrap things up and summarize our findings. First, what we found was that the implementation of the IRS PAT was associated with higher rates of non-financial release with limited impact on rates of pretrial misconduct. And with what impact we did see, we found evidence of those rates decreasing over time. Although we did find evidence of disparities in pretrial release outcomes, we did not find evidence of a disparate impact of risk assessments on those two groups of white and black defendants. Across almost all the pretrial release decisions we examined, we found consistent evidence that adherence to structured guidelines for pretrial release was key to successful implementation. And lastly, although it was not reported on here, we did examine judge level differences and we found limited evidence of judge level variability in decision making. So that wraps up our section of this presentation on the NIJ study findings. Um, we'll be available to answer questions during the Q&A, uh, but if you have any specific questions or would like a copy of the report, this is uh, Dr. Lauder's contact information. From here, I'm gonna hand things off to Dr. Grauman, who will reflect on these studies and discuss next steps. Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I wanna take a moment to echo Dr. Ray and, it's, and extend thanks to the 11 pilot counties, as well as the Indiana Office of Court Services who has supported this work. This research has been quite the heavy lift uh, for everyone involved. Uh, we made and will continue to make a lot of asks of our, our, our practitioner partners. Next slide, please. We have been in, in regular communication with each pilot county to comprehend local procedures and practices, to manage data issues, and to request feedback on our preliminary results. We would not be able to share the findings reported today without continued engagement and support of the pilot counties. The findings today symbolize the very best of researcher practitioner partnerships. By this, we mean that uh, uh, the adoption of new policies or practices, such as the rollout of IRAS guided pretrial decision making, directed our research questions, the research findings stimulated new questions and have implications for policy practice and research. As noted by Judge Spitzer to kick off our webinar, this cycle will continue to repeat itself over and over again as we work to improve pretrial policy and practice. Next slide, please. Today I'll provide some information that places our findings into a small but rapidly growing body of research literature on the effect of risk assessment tools on pretrial operations. I will also try to identify some of the research or practice gaps that jurisdictions will need to manage as our work to improve risk assessment guided decision making continues. Spencer provided us with the findings from our series of validation studies testing the predictive accuracy of IRAS. Dr. Lauder and Carmen provided us with insights about the effect of implementing IRAS guided decision making on release decisions and pretrial misconduct outcomes. Just to quickly summarize some of our key findings uh, thus far, the IRAS tool accurate, accurately predicts pretrial misconduct, the adoption of IRAS guided decision-making increases RORs, reduces rates of setting bond, and produces similar effect sizes on release outcomes for black and white defendants. Larger increases in RORs and greater reductions in bond setting occur, where there is close adherence to the structured guidelines jurisdictions develop to direct their release decisions. There were no changes in FTAs despite increases in release rates. However, there was a slight increase in new arrests that was largely driven by arrests for nonviolent offenses. There were no changes in new arrests for violent offenses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Now that we have a common understanding of Indiana's findings to date, I will now make some comparisons of Indiana's results to those found in other states. As Spencer noted earlier, among some of the more prominent risk assessment tools available, the IRAS performs just as well. The IRAS is slightly more accurate than the ORAS. This is a relevant finding because the IRAS is based off of the ORAS. Our results confirm that the ORAS can be transferred to Indiana and exceed common performance standards. Our results also indicate that the IRAS is slightly more accurate than the public safety assessment. This finding adds to a recent review of pretrial risk assessment tool performance that finds that interview-based pretrial risk assessment tools slightly outperform record-based assessments that do not require an interview. Next slide, please. Research examined, research examined the effect of pretrial risk assessment tools and the use of risk assessment guided decision making is difficult to interpret. One of the challenges is trying to identify a relevant point of comparison to know how pretrial operations were working before the use of instruments. You must possess a firm understanding of how pretrial operations were working in the absence of risk assessment tools. This is one of the main contribution of Dr. Lauder's work, uh, focusing on what sort of outcomes we will see in Indiana. When we try to place Indiana's results into broader context, I'm going to limit our presentation to the studies that have a suitable comparison group. These designs allow us to interpret the effect of adopting a risk assessment tool on release decision and pretrial misconduct outcomes in relation to past practices. Generally speaking, Indiana's findings are consistent with the research literature. Please note that the Ks reported here are an indicator of the number of research studies with these same or similar findings. The transition to risk assessment guided decision making is associated with increases in non-financial re release rates, excuse me, and no change in no, no change or slight increases in pretrial misconduct. Studies designed to try to differentiate categories of new arrests suggest that nonviolent offenses are the main contributors to arrest trends. Indiana's findings are also similar to another study suggesting that the adoption of risk assessment tools does not appear to reduce racial or ethnic disparities, but this change also does not exacerbate pre-existing disparities. Indiana's findings diverge from the research literature in one important way. Whereas the research literature uh, tends to find modest changes in non-financial rele release rates, we find fairly large increases and non-financial releases, particularly when we narrow our focus to initial decisions to ROR. Importantly, these trends continue over time. They do not appear to be deteriorating with more time away from IRAS adoption. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn to three interrelated practice and research gaps that jurisdictions will need to manage to continue to improve risk assessment guided pretrial decision making. Next slide. First is the need to deepen our understanding of local decision making. As signaled by every presenter so far, there is important variation in local rules and procedures on how the IRES is administered and linked to structured decision making guidelines. Variation by jurisdiction plus the role of discretion at multiple, by multiple justice system actors at multiple phases of case processing will shape pretrial release decisions and misconduct outcomes. This focus is critical. We should not be underneath the assumption that the mere adoption of a pretrial risk assessment tool or the production of a score or a risk classification will automatically translate to improve performance measures. We must work to understand how the information gathered from pretrial risk assessment instruments are used in practice. There are a host of areas that we need to examine to deepen our understanding of local decision making. Our research was able to explore whether judges made different release decisions in the absence and presence of risk assessment information. We did not find there to be much evidence to suggest that variation in, in judicial decision making is contributing to our overall findings. That said, we did find that close adherence to structured guidelines enhanced rates of non-financial release. Adherence to defined guidelines is a product of administering assessments 
scoring those assessments, presenting release or supervision recommendations to the court, and judicial decision making. In combination, these highlights, these results highlight the complexity of trying to pinpoint the wide array of plausible factors that influence local decision making and the actions taken by local jurisdictions to manage the risk of FTAs and public safety. Next slide, please. Second, we need to continue to work to face and address disparities. There have been productive debates about the use of risk assessments. On one hand, assessments have the potential to exacerbate inequities in the justice system through the use of items that are correlated with or moderated by race or ethnicity. On the other hand, assessments have the potential to increase non-financial re release decisions and make release decision making more consistent, especially if assessments are validated to the local populations being served. Unfortunately, we do not have a volume of research on how pretrial pre risk assessment tools are used and practiced to draw firm conclusions and inform this debate. So the preliminary evidence suggests that the adoption of risk assessments do not exacerbate and do not reduce disparities. In short, the very few studies that we have are telling us that increases in RORs and increases in non-financial release decisions may not translate to large enough rates of release for racial or ethnic minorities. Stated differently, increases in ROrs and non-financial release decisions may not be sufficient enough to correct pre-existing disparities. In order to address disparities, we must be able to collect, share, and monitor data on how individuals enter and proceed through various phases of local justice systems. This will form an important baseline to understand the size and the scope of the disparities that exist. These data can direct risk assessment scoring modifications that account for different rates of past justice system contact amongst defendants. You will also need to monitor whether risk assessment items vary by race or ethnicity or gender. Risk assessment instruments are expected to produce similar results regardless of, of the defendant. When tools produce inconsistent, inaccurate, or inequitable results, changes to items, item scoring procedures, and risk classification cutoffs must be introduced. Next slide, please. Third, we need to examine strategies to make pretrial risk assessment tools more applicable to local jurisdictions. By this, I mean adjusting scoring, classification cutoffs, and structured decision-making guidelines to better suit the dynamics of one's county. It also involves difficult conversations that seek to find balance between desires to maximize release, release rates, minimize misconduct, and apply more restrictive release options. There's an important caveat to keep in mind when speaking about fine tuning our assessments and our structured guidelines. Local jurisdictions must start with the validation of their risk assessment tool. Without a validation, we will not be able to identify the items that are contributing to the overall scores. We will not know the distribution of scores or their classifications. We will not be able to make appropriate corrections. Once these adjustments are made, we must commit to continuing to monitor performance by completing revalidations and, revi and revising our structured decision-making guidelines to determine if we found balance in our efforts to maximize release and minimize misconduct. Next slide, please. To try and make these points a little bit less abstract, consider an example from Hennepin County, Minnesota. Note this county includes the city of, Min of Minneapolis, I'm picking on Hennepin County because uh, they have completed multiple validations of their tools. This county was an early adopter of pretrial risk assessment tools. Pretrial services in this county integrated a modified version of the Vera Institute of Justice's scale in the 1970s. The instrument has been revalidated and modified numerous times over the years. I'm focusing my summary on three of the more recent revalidations. The first validation found that half of the defendants were classified as high risk. The study found that pretrial services was overriding more than half, almost half of the assessments they administered. Most of the overrides recommended more restrictive release options. Digging into these data a bit, uh, the researchers uh, who are working out of Hennepin County 
found that staff were overriding classifications for substance use disorders, mental health issues, the volume of low level convictions and FTAs. Staff were also overriding classifications when they were unable to score the assessment tool, lacking specific information that could be fed into the tool. The validation also found one item to be no longer predictive of pretrial misconduct and three items that led to higher or lower scores depending upon the defendant's race or ethnicity. And all items were dropped, scoring changes were introduced uh, for half of the remaining items and new items were added based upon an understanding of how the predictive accuracy of the instrument was estimated and how it was being used in practice. The second validation focused on the revised instrument. Here, risk classifications were more evenly distributed across risk levels. There was a dramatic reduction in overrides. By conventional standards, the instrument performed well. The second validation also suggested that revisions were associated with reductions at the local jail. The first year the revised instrument went live, there was a 5% reduction in jail population. Three years after the instrument was uh, revised and implemented, there appeared to be approximately a 15% reduction. This revised instrument was also subject to a validation study. More specific definitions and policy directives on how to score items were integrated. Scoring adjustments were made and one additional item was, that was previously discarded was reintroduced. Next slide, please. This revised instrument was also revalidated. In this third validation, the distribution of risk classifications shifted. A higher proportion of defendants were classified as low risk. Next slide, please. You'll notice that the accuracy of the most recent revision to the instrument is more variable than the last validation. Well, at first glance, this may lead us to conclude that the most recent revision is negatively impacting the performance of their risk assessment tool. The jurisdiction was working to manage FTA risks amongst, among their population by implementing text and email notification systems. This led to significant reductions in FTAs in Hennepin County. Uh, we may expect similar types of reductions in the future for Hamilton County. Given these reductions, the baseline rate of FTAs changed and affected the, abilities, uh, the ability of the instrument to accurately predict this form of pretrial misconduct. So I give us this example as it highlights the need to continuously calibrate our risk assessment tools. It also demonstrates the importance of trying to understand local policies and practices. Next slide, please. The directions moving forward will require us to develop a strong understanding of local dynamics and how context shapes release and misconduct outcomes. We should expect there to be substantial variation across counties and how risk assessments perform and how they are used to inform decision making. We should also recognize that a validation or an assessment of pretrial operations is a start, it's not an end. The residents we serve and the crime challenges we will manage will continue to change. We will ask new questions. We will work to integrate the newest innovations. The information generated from these research activities will allow us to monitor performance, cele celebrate our successes, and direct adjustments to policy and practice when needed. Thank you for your time and attention today. I look forward to our conversation. Thanks everybody. I, I want to just especially thank our panelists and participants today. Uh, and I'm going to start the Q&A with just a couple of housekeeping items here. So we have been responding to some of the Q&A items in the chat. So you can take a look there at those. Um, we'll also have a copy of the presentation available. Some folks had asked about that after this. Those questions that we're not able to answer, we actually end here in one minute so folks can stay on for the questions, but we'll try and uh, pull those materials together and send something out to you all. Um, but I was wondering if we could just start the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Lauder, I was wondering if you could address one of the comments on whether or not the disparate impact is economic and not racial. That was one of the comments that came up. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, absolutely that's something that's been, uh, you know, reflected in the literature. You know, there's this, um, you know, Quite, quite a lot of research that has looked at the cumulative disadvantage of kind of early pretrial release decisions. Um, 
you know, even if individuals, um, you know, receive, you know, low bail amounts, are they able to get out of um, pretrial detention? We know that individuals who are detained pretrial are more likely to get convicted. They're more likely to get harsher sentences, including um, potentially prison and longer prison terms. So, I mean, absolutely, I think that's something, um, you know, and then of course, when those individuals get into the community that has adverse effects on, you know, their ability to, you know, maintain secure employment, um, even their family uh, relationships, we know that those individuals are more likely to uh, make use of, you know, social services. Um, so I think that's, I mean, it's definitely a valid question, uh, something that, you know, we was kind of beyond the scope of the original study. Um, so we didn't, you know, look at it, but absolutely. I mean, I think it's something to be mindful of in the future. Judge Spitzer, I was wondering if you could address the question from Robert Roberts on the verification of the IRS PAT responses and just generally more concerns about um, accuracy of uh, the honesty of the information. Okay, hey, sure, um, Brad. So I, I think one of the things that we need to remember is that the IRAS PAT is not the only um, method of a, deci a release decision being made. There's other information typically that's relied upon by the judge when determining um, a, uh, whether or not to release. Um, and uh, many counties have delegated some release authority um, for certain levels um, uh, or certain circumstances uh, for low risk individuals, for example, we do in Indiana. Um, but um, a lot of the cases will come to something called a meaningful first hearing where there's an opportunity um, for uh, a testimony to be taken and virtually, and I think all counties are also verifying um, some portion of the um, uh, of, of the information that's that that is being communicated to the court um, with regards to whether or not to release. And so, looking at things like criminal history, employment, uh, I'm trying to think of some other things that we verify uh, whether or not there are other pending criminal offenses, um, whether or not there are warrants. Um, and so, this is not a. I think there's a misapprehension out there that IRAS PAT. Um, that release decisions are being made only on what defendants tell us. Um, and so that is, that's not the case. And, and all of the pilots are doing independent verification um, of, of certain information. Thanks, Judge Spitzer. Um, Dr. Lauder, I was wondering if you could answer a question from Spurgeon Kennedy uh, around defining the FTA. I know you might not be able to speak to this at the court level, but just from the research side of things. Yeah, absolutely. It has been one of our biggest challenges um, across jurisdictions. Um, so Indiana does have, um, as part of their court data management system odyssey, they do have a way to kind of flag um, FTA events um, in the data. What we were finding when we started doing the validations is that those FTAs were um, underrecorded um, in the court record. So we had to kind of find creative ways to, you know, create pseudo measures of um, FTA to be able to, you know, validate um, the IRS PAT assessments for that outcome. So one thing that we um, were able to do is to actually use a combination of court, court warrant records, which do not unfortunately tell us um, what the warrant was for. We just get a, um, you know, indication that there was a warrant issued, um, but we have the date that it was issued. We also have the date that it was um, served. And then we also have jail records, which can tell us whether someone was booked on an FTA warrant. So essentially what we did is we saw, okay, well, was someone booked on an FTA warrant in the jail? And then based on that day of the booking, we could kind of connect it, you know, to a warrant um, that would have been served on that date within, you know, a day or two to account for, you know, data entry, um, you know, lag time or whatever. Um, but that allowed us basically to connect that kind of jail booking, um, you know, event with an FTA, uh, you know, warrant charge on it to a um, original uh, warrant issue date in the court data, as well as to a specific court case that that individual was, um, you know, on uh, pretrial uh, release for. 
Uh, one more question I was going to ask to you, Dr. Lauder. Susan Carter asked if we could give some more explanation around counties with structured guidelines. Yeah, so there were three, um, and I, I, uh, I think I messaged her, but it was Allen, Monroe, and Hamilton. Um, and I'm trying to remember the specifics of Allen County's uh, matrix. Um, they targeted their pilot population, their pilot program to a very specific population of felony level um, defendants. So the actual matrix was barely um, limited because it was focused on such a very specific population. I believe Hamilton was mainly, um, you know, release on own recognizance um, with varying levels of supervision or that individual would have been detained until their first appearance um, in front of the judge. Uh, and then Monroe County, of course, um, as Troy kind of alluded to, um, incorporated a lot of different things. So there was, you know, the bail schedule was incorporated there along with kind of the uh, charge uh, levels as well as types. Um, and then, of course, that also kind of was cross tabulated with um, the risk levels. And of course, the risk levels were incorporated to kind of varying degrees um, across all the three matrices. But yeah, so there were three jurisdictions that use those. All right. Well, we're we're gonna we're over by time right now. So I just want to ask the other panelists: Are there any other questions that popped up that any of you specifically would like to address before we end? Brad, can I chime in one minute? Absolutely. Um, there's been a few questions. I've just reading the feed quickly. Uh, if folks are interested in some of the studies I tried to summarize uh, quickly, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to provide a copy. Uh, we might want to plug Judge Spitzer's ears here. Uh, but I can get around some of the paywalls uh, to provide you some of these studies directly. Uh, so feel free to reach out uh, to any one of the research partners. Thanks, Eric. Brad, I think I, uh, if I could add, I, I know a lot of the questions talk about home detention. Um, I think there may be a misapprehension that there's a lot of use of home detention in connection with um, pretrial, and that is not the case. Um, it, as a matter of fact, I think jurisdictions that started using a fair amount of home detention have really moved away from that. And so um, there is, um, pretrial does not mean you put everybody on home detention. As a matter of fact, it should be rare um, that, that, that that happens. So I wanna make sure that we don't leave that misapprehension. Um, the other, question, the other question I think that came up and the concern was with financial obligations is charge for pretrial. We don't charge for pretrial and I don't know, Troy, do you guys uh, charge for pretrial and Stephanie? Yes, there is a small charge that's uh, going to the defendant for pretrial services that is listed in statute that you can charge for pretrial services. Um, however, that's one of our future initiatives to explore is, is that uh, do an analysis on collection of those fees and and whether we can go without those. I would just echo what, what Troy said um, based on state statute. And, and to make it clear as well, I, I, would, I don't believe anybody is just for, uh, anybody is incarcerating people for just failing to pay uh, pretrial fees. Um, so and as a matter of fact, that would be inappropriate. So I wanted to make sure that that impression was not left as well. Any other final parting thoughts? Any other questions folks wanted to address? All right, so really cannot thank you all enough for joining. We'll be following up with the attendees here today with uh, um, some further information. And please, if it didn't come through, I just wanna reiterate, we're all ridiculously approachable individuals. So please don't hesitate to follow up with us with any questions or comments that you might have about this. Again, thank you all so much for your time today. Have a good one.